on the regular pencil. Mm -hmm. Ways before, after. Mm, that's crazy. I was just uh, recently reading that story a little bit. So, mm. ways gone. Mm. Enoch walk with God, Genesis 5, 22. Walk before me, Genesis uh, that's gonna be seventeen one. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, Deuteronomy thirteen four. You will have anticipated that I suppose my purpose in doing what I worse out many do, cutting little snippets of the different verses to putting them together. You see that these three three fragments in the resemblance and in their differences are equally significant and instructive. They concur in regarding life as a walk, a metaphor which expresses a continuity so that every man's life is a whole, which expresses progress, which expresses change, and which implies a goal. They agree in saying that God must be brought into a life somehow and in some aspect if that life is to be anything else but an aimless wandering. If it is to tend to the point which every human life should attain, but then they diverge and if we put them together, they say to us that it, there are three different ways in which we ought to bring God into our life. We should walk with him like Enoch. We should walk before him as Abraham was bid to do. And we should walk after him as the command to do was given to all Israel. And these three propositions with, before, after attached to the general idea of life as a walk give us a triple aspect which yet is of course fundamentally one of the way in which life may be ennobled dignified calmed hallowed focused and constituted by the various relations into which we enter with him so i take the three of them one enoch walked with god that is a sweet, simple, easily intelligible, and yet lofty way of putting the notion which we bring to a more abstract and less impressive shape when we talk about the commun communion with God. Two men traveling along the road keep each other company. How can two walk together except they be great? The companion is at our side all the time. Though the mists may have come down, if we can see him, we can hear his voice, we can grasp his hand, we can catch the echoes of the steps. We know he's there, and that is enough. Enoch and God walk together. But the simple exercise of faith that it fills invisible with one great loving face. But a continuous, definite effort as we are going through the bustles of a daily life, and amid all the pettiness and perplexities and monotony, monotonies that make up our often weary and always heavy days, we can realize to ourselves that He is of the truth and our sides, and by purity of the life of heart, we can bring Him nearer and can make ourselves more conscious of His nearness. For brethren, the one thing that parts a man from God and make it impossible for a heart to expatiate in the thought of his presence, is the contrariety of his will in our conduct. The slightest invisible film of mist that comes across the blue abyss of the mighty sky will blow out the brightest stars that we may sometimes not be able to see the mist and only know that it is there because we do not see the planet. So unconscious sin is still in between us and God, and we shall no longer be able to say, I walk with him. 
What an insight, huh? Mm. The Roman Catholic taught in their mechanical way of bringing down all the spiritual into the material and the formal about the practice of the presence of God. Talking about the Brother Lawrence and this book, okay? So mm. he's, a, he's a monk, I guess. So here we go. The very, very good assessment here, okay? So what he says is a mechanical way, you know, so formula. It is an ugly phrase, but it means a great deal, a great thing. The Christian people ought very much more than they do to aim day by day and miss their daily duties and realize that the most elementary thought, which like a great many other elementary thoughts, is important because we believe it so utterly that wherever we are, we may have him with us. It is the secret of blessedness, of tranquility, the power of everything good and noble. I am a stranger with thee, and the sojourner, as all my fathers were, said the son of the fold. If he had left out these two little words, with thee, it would have been answering a tragic complaint, but when they come in, oh, that is painful. All that is solitary, all that is transient, bitterly transient, in the long succession, of the generations that have passed across earth's sin, had not been conjured to it, is cleared away and changed into gladness. Never mind, though you are a stranger, if you have that companion, never mind, though you are only a soldier, if you have him with you. Whatever passes, he will not pass. And though you dwell here in a system in a system to which we do not belong, and its transiency and our transiency bring with them many sorrows, when we can see Lord that has been our dwelling place in all generations, we are at home, and that eternal home will never pass. Enoch walked with God, and of course God took him. There was Nothing else for it, and there could be no other end. Well, a life communion with God here has in it the prophecy and the pledge of a life internal union hereafter. So then, practice the presence of God, the old mystic says. If I can tell how many times today I have thought about the God, I have not thought about Him often enough. Walk with Him by faith, by effort, by purity. Two, and now take the other aspects suggested by the other word God spoke to Abraham. I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thy prophet. That suggests that I suppose I do not need to point it out. The idea, not only of communion, which the former phrase brought to our minds, but that of uh, the inspection, inspection of our conduct. As ever in the great taskmaster's eyes, says the stern Puritan poet, and also one may object to that word taskmaster, and the idea conveyed is the correct expansion, the commandment given to Abraham. Observe, whole walk before me is doubted, as it were, between the revelation, I am the Almighty God, as the injunction, be thou perfect. Let me drink something here, okay? The realization was then the presence of the, the Almighty, which is implied in, in the expression, walk before me, the assurance that we are in his sight will lead straight to the fulfillment of all the injunction that it bears upon the moral conduct. The same connection of thought analyzes Peter's injunction like, and he is holy, so be ye holy. In all manners of conversation, follow the immediately as it is by, if you call on him as a father, whom without, <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> without respect of persons, judges, as a present estimate, According to every male's work, past the time of your soldiering here in fear, that the reverence show all which will lead you to be holy 
even as I am holy. The thought that we are in that divine presence, and then there is a silently but not really a divine opinion being formed of us, consolidated as it were, moment by moment through our lives, is only tolerable if we have been walking with God. If we are sure by the power of our communion with Him, of His loving heart as well as His righteous judgment, then we can spread ourselves out before Him as a woman will lay out her webs of cloth on the green grass for the sun to blaze down upon them and bleach the ingrained filth out of them. We must first walk with God before the consciousness that we are walking before Him becomes one that we can entertain and not go mad, not go mad. When we are sure that the ways we can bear the before. Do you ever see how on a review day with each successive battling and companion years a saluting point where the general inspecting seats, they straighten themselves up to dress their ranks and pull themselves together as they pass beneath the critical eye. The master's eye make diligent servants. If we in the strength of God would only realize day by day and act by act our lives that we are before him what resolution could be affected in our character, on our character, and what a transformation on all our conduct? Walk before me, and ye shall, you shall be perfect. For the Hebrew words on which I am now commenting may be read in accordance with the uses of the language as being not only a commandment, but a promise, or rather, not as two commandments, but a, a commandment with a, appended a promise, as so as equivalent to, if you will walk before me, you will be perfect. You will be perfect. If we realize that we are under the pure eyes of perfect judgment of God, we shall thereby be strongly urged, mindedly helped, to be perfect as he is perfect. That's a word, word, insightful, and accurate understand that word, right? So, we're practical. Mm. Yeah. Implied, the word sanctification means, you know, right. so. Your soul, body, and spirit will be sanctified as holy unto God. Yeah. Three. Lastly, take the other relation, which is suggested by the third of my tests, where Israel as a whole is commanded to walk after the Lord their God. In harmony with the very frequent expression of the Old Testament about going after idols, so Israel here is to go after God. What does that mean? Communion, the consciousness of being judged by God, will lead on to aspiration, a loving, long effort to get nearer and nearer to Him. My soul follows hard up thee, says the psalmist. Thy right hand upholds me that element of yearning aspiration, of eager desire to be closer and closer, a liker and liker, to God must be in all true religion. And unless we have it in some measure, it is used to talk about being Christian people, to press onward, not as though we had already attained, but falling after, if that, we may apprehend that for which also we are apprehended. In the attitude, of every true follower of Christ. The very crown of the excellency of uh, the Christian life is that it never can reach the goal, and therefore a immortal youth, aspiration, and growth is guaranteed to it. Christian people, are you following after God? Are you any nearer to Him? When you are 10 years old, walk with me, walk before me, and walk after me. I need not to do more than remind you of another meaning involved in this same expression. If I walk after God, then I let him go before me and show me my road. Do you remember how when the ark was to cross Jordan, the commandment was given to the Israelites to let it go well on in front, so that there should be no mistake about the course. The course. For ye have not passed this way here before. 
Do not be in too great a hurry to press upon the heels of God, if I may so say. Do not let your decisions are the wrong is a providence. Keep back the impatience that would hurry on and wait for his ripening purposes to ripen and his counsels to develop themselves. Walk after God and be sure you do not go in front of your guide or you will lose both your way and your guide. I need not say more than a word about the highest aspect with this third of our commandments takes. His shape follow him, leaving us example that we would follow in his steps. That is culmination of the walking with and before and after God, which this old commandment sense were partially practicing. All that gather into the one great word, he then says he abides in him, all himself also to walk even as he walks. Are you continue there? Mm -hmm. We want to read the next chapter? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> the course and crown of a devout life. Genesis, Genesis 5, 24 doesn't give me the scripture. Arina could walk with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay. This notice of Enoch occurs in the course of a catalog of the descendants of Adam, from the creation to the deluge. It is evidently a very ancient document and is constructed on a remarkable plan. The formula for each man is the same. So-and-so lived, begat his heir, the next in the series, lived on after that so many years, having anonymous children, lived altogether so long and then died. The chief thing about each life is the birth of the successor and each man's career is in broad outline the same. A dreary monotony runs through the ages. How brief and uniform may be the records of lives of striving and tears and smiles and love that stretch through, the cent through centuries. Nine hundred years shrink into less than as many lives. The solemn monotony is broken in the case of Enoch. This paragraph begins as usual. He lived. But afterwards, instead of that word, we read that he walked with God. Happy they for whom such a phrase is equivalent to live, and instead of died, it is said of him that he was not. That seems to imply that he, as it were, slipped out of sight or suddenly disappeared. As one of the Psalms says, I looked, and lo, he was not. He was there a moment ago, now he was gone. And my text tells how that sudden withdrawal came about. God, with whom he walked, put out his hand and took him to himself. Of course, what other end could there be to a life that was all passed in communion with God except that apotheosis and crown of it all, the lifting of a man into closer communion with his father and his friend? So then, there are just these two things here, the noblest life and its crown. Number one, the noblest life. He walked with God. That is all. There is no need to tell what he did or tried to do, how he sorrowed or joyed, what were his circumstances. These may all fade from men's knowledge as they have somewhat faded from his memory up yonder. It is enough that he walked with God. Of course, we have here, underlying the phrase, the familiar comparison of life to a journey, with all its suggestions of constant change and constant effort, and with the suggestion, too, that each life should be a pro progress directly tending to one clearly recognized goal. But passing from that, let us just think for a moment of the characteristics which must go to make up a life of which we can say that it was that it is walking with God. The first of these clearly is the one that the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews puts his finger upon when he makes faith the spring of Enoch's career. The first requisite to true communion with God is vigorous exercise of that faculty by which we realize the fact of his presence with us, and that not as a jealous-eyed inspector, from, the, from whose scrutiny we would fain escape, but as a, command, as a companion and friend to whom we can cleave. He that cometh to God, and walks with God, must first of all believe that he is, and passing by all the fascinations of things seen, and rising above all the temptations of things temporal, his realizing eye must fixed upon 
must fix upon the Divine Father and see Him nearer and more clearly than these. You cannot walk with God unless you are emancipated from the dominion of sense and time and are living by the power of that great faculty which lays hold of the things that are unseen as the realities and smiles at the false and forged pretensions of material things to be the real. We have to invert the teaching of the world and of our senses. My fingers and my eyes and my ears tell me that this gross material universe about me is the real, <laughs> and that all beyond it is shadowy and, sometimes we think, <laughs> doubtful, or at any rate, dim and far off. But that is false, and the truth is precisely the other way. <coughs> the unseen is the real. The unseen is the real. And the material is merely is the merely apparent. Behind all visible objects, and giving them all their reality, lies the unchangeable God. Cultivate the faculty and habit of vigorous faith, if you would walk with God. For the world will put its bandages over your eyes, and try to tempt you to believe that these poor, shabby illusions are the precious things. And we have to shake ourselves free from its harlot kisses and its glozing lies by the very vigorous and continual efforts of the will and of the understanding, if we are to make real to ourselves that which is real, the presence of our God. Besides this vigorous exercise of the faculty of faith, there is another requisite for a walk with God, closely connected with it, and yet capable of being looked at separately, and that is, that we shall keep up the habit of continual occupation, occupation of thought with Him. Mm. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> <It's> done, <yeah. laughs> Somewhere. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> That is very much an affair of habit with Christian people, and I am afraid that the neglect of it is the habitual practice of the bulk of professing oh, Christians nowadays. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't change much. Yeah. <coughs> it is hard, amidst all our work and thought and joys and sorrows, to keep fresh our consciousness of his presence and to talk with him in the midst of the rush of business. But what do we do about our dear ones when we are far away from them? The measure of our love of them is accurately represented by the frequency of our remembrances of them. The mother parted from her child, the husband and the wife separated from one another, the lover and the friend, think of each other a thousand times a day. Whenever the spring is taken off and the natural bent of the inclination and heart assert themselves and the mind goes back again as into a sanctuary into the sweet thought. Mm. Is that how we do it with God? Do we so walk with Him as that thought, when, re when released, instinctively sets in that direction? When I take off the brake, does my spirit turn to God? Is there no hand at the helm? Does the bow always point that way? Oh, wow. When the magnet is withdrawn for a moment, does the needle tremble back and settle itself northwards? We are, if we are walking with God, we shall, more times a day than we can count when the evening comes on, have had the thought of Him coming into our hearts like some sweet beguiling me melody. Mm -hmm. So sweet, we know not what we are listening to it. Thus, we shall walk with God. Mm -hmm. There, Then there is another requisite. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Some agreement, conversation yeah. going on. Uh -huh. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. There is no union with God in such communion possible unless there be a union with him by conformity of will and submission of effort and aim to his commandments. When, well, then, is that life possible for us? Look at this instance before us. We know very little about how much knowledge of God these people in old days had, but, at all events, it was a great deal less than you and I have. Their theology was very different from ours. Their religion was absolutely identical with ours. Their faith, which grasped the God, which grasped the God revealed in their creed, was the same as our faith, though the creed which their faith grasped was only an outline sketch of yours and mine. <coughs> but at all times and in all generations, the element and essence of the religious life has been the same, that is, the realizing sense of the living divine presence, the effort and aspiration after communion with him, and the quiet obedience and conformity of the practical life to his will. And so we can reach out our hands across all the centuries to this pre-Noachian antediluvian patriarch, 
<laughs> and seems to be worse, huh? No wanking, that's no obviously. Yeah, yes. before no. Are the gluing. The Emelon's in this and feel that he too is Sorry. our brother. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. Well, and that's he, our word to remember, so. Yeah. Are the gluing before the Dalugi. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. And he has set us the example that in all conditions of life and under the most unfavorable circumstances, it is possible to live in this close touch with God. For in his time, not only was there, as I have said, an incomplete and rudimentary knowledge of God, but in his time the earth was filled with violence. Gigantic forms of evil are represented as having dominated mankind. Amidst it all, the titanic pride, the godlessness, the scorn, the rudeness, and the violence, amidst it all, this one white flower of a blameless life managed to find nutriment upon the dunghill and to blossom fresh and fair there. Mm. You and I cannot, whatever may be our hindrances in living a consistent Christian life, have anything like the difficulties that this man had and, surmount and surmounted. Oh. For us all, whatever our conditions, such a life is possible. Mm. And then there is another lesson that well, he teaches study, us. Right? Yeah. In the word of Colossians. Hmm. Hmm. And then there is another lesson that he teaches us. That is, that such a life is consistent with the completest discharge of all common duties. The outline, as far as appearance was concerned, of this man's life was the same as the outline of those of his ancestors and successors. They are all described in the same terms. The formula is the same. Enoch lived. Mahalalil. Maha and all the rest of the half unpronounceable <laughs> names, they lived, they begat their heirs and sons and daughters, and then they died. And the same formula is used about this man. He walked with God, but it was while treading the common path of secular life that he did so. He found it possible to live in communion with God, and yet to do all the common things that men did then. Anybody's house may be a, a Bethlehem house, of God. Oh, anybody's house may be a Bethel, the house of God, mm -hmm. and anybody's work may be worship. And wherever we are and whatever we do, it is possible therein to serve God and there to walk with him. Mm -hmm. Number two, and now a word about the crown of this life of communion. He was not, for God took him. What a wonderful reticence in describing or rather hinting at the stupendous miracle that is here in question. Is that like a book that came from the legend-loving and legend-making brains of men? Or does it sound like the speech of God, to whom nothing is extraordinary and nothing needs to have a mark of admiration after it? It was the same to him whether Enoch died or whether he simply took him to himself. If one wants to know what men would have made of such a thing, if they had had to tell it, let them read those wretched rabbinical fables that have been s stitched on to this verse. There they will see how men describe miracles, and here they will see how God does so. Do you want to think there's a book Enoch? Do you think there should be a book Enoch in reality? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Enoch don't know the right those days, the Hebrew before Abraham, long, long time ago. Hmm. So don't tell me, Hebrew language was not even there, so, yeah. Uh, this talking, if they translate in other languages, it's hard to imagine that. Right, so, yeah. There had to be some sort of recording system, or else they wouldn't have known the names of all these people that lived after Adam, right? Yeah, something that nature. Yeah, something that's was recorded somewhere. <laughs> walk. But with Zenas, it's a whole book, so yeah. yeah. You're true. Yes. You're, you're, you're a good argument there, but. I, I thought in realistic fashion to be a whole book passed on like that. So right. if Enoch is dead, then he said he was sent from heaven to carry a message that will give a book to, to mankind. Do you think that possible? That's not possible. Right? So hmm. Man died and died. So yeah. in the Bible. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's my point. Yeah. Right? Mm. Go ahead. He was not. Until Christ was resurrected, then he would not be there, right? So, that may be from the spirits, whatever, but the person 
will not come back as if an angel sends for them. I'm not sure, so, yeah. Hmm. I don't know much about the book, really, but it would seem that, I guess the interpretation of he walked with God would mean that he had heavenly experiences while alive, and maybe had, that it was I'm talking about the original of the book of Enoch. You know, somebody, either passed on, he wrote it, he predicted the future, or somehow... Yeah. He come down from heaven and share the book with people. So it's interesting, you know, let's mm. think about more the those kind of uh, on books are where Dubers is our region, you know, you know, so Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. As I have said, he disappeared. That was what the world knew. God took him, that was what God tells the world. Thus the strange exception to the law of death stood as I suppose, to the ancient world as doing somewhat the same office for them that the translation of Elijah afterwards partially did for Israel, and that the resurrection of Jesus Christ does completely for us. That is, it brought the future life into the realm of fact and took it out of the dim region of speculation altogether. He establishes a truth who proves it, and he proves a fact that shows it. A doctrine of a future state is not worth much, but the fact of a future state, but the fact of a future state, which was established by this incident then, is certified for us all now by the Christ risen from the dead, is all important. Our gospel is all built upon facts, and this is the earliest fact in man's history which made man's substance and other conditions than that of earthly life a certainty. And then again, this wonderful exception shows to us as it did to that ancient world, that the natural end of a religious life is union with God hereafter. It seems to me that the real proofs of a future life are two. One, the fact of Christ's resurrection, and the other, the fact of our religious experience. For anything looks to me more likely, and less incredible, that a man who would walk with God should only have a poor earthly life to do it in, and that all these aspirations, these emotions, should be bounded and ended by a trivial thing that touches only the physical frame. Surely, surely, there is nothing so absurd as to believe that he who can say, Thou art my God, and who has said it, should ever by anything be brought to cease to say it. Death cannot kill love to God, and the only end of the religious life of earth is its perfecting in heaven. The experiences that we have here, and their loftiness and their incompleteness, equally witness for us of the rest in the perfectness that remain for the children of God. Then again, this man in his unique experience was and is a witness, a witness of the fact that death is an excrescence. Excrescence? No what does that mean? No idea. It's the first time I've ever heard that word. A distant algorithm. On a human animal body, on a plant, especially one that is without a disease, abnormality, unattractive or su superfluous addition of nature. Hmm. See. A witness of the fact that death is an excrescence and results from sin. I suppose that he trod the road which the divine intention had destined to be trodden by all the children of men, if they had not sinned. And that his experience, unique as it is, is a survival, so to speak, of what was meant to be the law for humanity, unless there had intervened the terrible fact of sin and its wages, death. The road had been made, and this one man was allowed to travel along it, that we might all learn, by the example of the exception, that the rule under which we live was not the rule that God originally meant for us. Yeah, basically do a lot of exposition along the scene idea and right? I so mm. let's fast move forward so we move to the next uh, next uh, paragraph so okay mm -hmm. let me remind you that this unique and exceptional end of a life of communion may in its deepest essential character be experienced by each of us I want to move forward fast because it's a long book you know so sure. you read everything might be worth time so, okay, so. <coughs> So let's move on. So. Okay. There are two passages in the book of Psalms, both of which I regard as allusions to this incident. The one of them is in the 49th Psalm and reads thus, 
He will deliver my soul from the power of the grave, for he will take me. Our version conceals the illusion by its unfortunate and non-literal rendering, receive. The same word is employed there as here. Can we fail to see the reference? The psalmist expects his soul to be delivered from the power of the grave because God takes it. And again in the great 73rd Psalm, which marks perhaps the high water mark of pre-Christian anticipations of a future state, we read, Thou wilt guide me by thy counsel, and afterwards take me, again the same word, to glory. Here again, the psalmist looks back to the unique and exceptional instance, and in the rapture and ecstasy of the faith that has grasped the living God as his portion, says to himself, Though the externals of Enoch's end and of mine may differ, the substance will be the same, and I too shall cease to be seen of men, because God takes me into the secret of his pavilion, mm. the loving clasp of his lifting hand. I want to share two testimonies with you for understanding purposes with this taken for sure, or taken in the internal realm in the time when it's appropriate. The mind of Christ came, he will take us into his glory. But in the experiences, at least I personally experienced it, there is a two ways God visited man. He visited you where you are, and he allowed you to visit him where he is. So it's each has a unique experiences, okay? When come to you to occupy you in the sense of take you, take your personality, you pretty much, uh, it's like another person take hold of you. And it's very strange for people to think like that, but I have been taken over by God's Spirit to do things I can never imagine, okay? So it's like somebody else was taking over my body, do things, so. The other is uh, he take you into his body, where he is. Now that is also happening physically here, but it's like you overtaken to other realm, right? So, I was taken over by God, uh, take away by God, to see things from his eyes. You know, literally seeing everything melt like all the fire around. Um, you might. Only take those things as a personal experiences, some strange experiences. Well, my suggestion to you is uh, pray hard for visitation of God because visitation of God changes your whole way of thinking. And uh, the many of the things we imagine, how to experience God, how the words do that, and uh, the possibility of what God can do with us when they're breaking down, you know. It, you know, people can never tell me, God cannot take you, you know, or God cannot take all your personality. That has happened to me, so I don't, I don't care your theology, your arguments, whatever. It's a holy God in a very meaningful moment, pure holy moment, did that. So those things later on gave me great confidence and liberty to understand his counsel, his ways many things. Am I making sense to you? You know, so to lend you great confidence in walking before him, you know, so walking with him. So, you know, pray hard for those things. It does not come easily. It's not an everyday thing. So, but one visitation like that, it's pretty, you know, sad the undergirding tune of uh, your relations with him sometimes. Making sense to you? You know, so go ahead. <clears throat> Enoch was led, if I may say so, from the top of the valley, beyond the headwaters of the dark river, and was kept on the high level until he got to the other side. You and I have to go down the hill, out of the sunshine, in among the dank weeds, to stumble over the black rocks and wade through the deep water. But we shall get over to the same place where he stands, and he that took him round by the top will take us to the river. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. <coughs> Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Mm. This verse is like some little spring with trees and flowers on a cliff. Hold on there, I have a thought on the ship. Is why in the flow, so. Mm. Uh, turn to Habakkuk if you have the book with you, the Bible with you. Habakkuk. 
I think I grab my Bible also on my, my table also. Okay. Yeah. So in, let's see in, Abigail basically the Abigail was complaining to God, you know, so that God revealed his glory to him. So the I somehow a little bit experience a little bit of this, okay? So that's what I'm trying to tell you. Therefore when I experience those things without knowing the scriptures of times, it's very hard to comprehend what's happened to me, you know. So then when I read the scripture like that it really opened up a lot of things for you, you know, see my point, you know, so have you already been taken into, not physically, but spiritually lightning, thunder, all over it, everything. But you were there, then you, you can't help to re being reminded lightning and thunders when you, physical things happen, right? So, and, uh, but I don't know, I mean, it's, it's very hard to exp ex explain the kind of spiritual visitation experience you have. But when you have those things, scriptures, or the experience, those similar experience experienced by others, will be self-explanatory. You don't need to imagine. You don't need to say, hey, I don't know what that means, you know, and make, make it some use. So this is one of the occasions I need to read from a verse one there. Which chapter are you? It's a three chapter, Habakkuk. Okay. And the three, uh, two, from two there, so. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. So he had visitation. He heard Moses had encounter with God, and one had the same encounter. They entered, unlike many others, am I? David, I think Elijah had the same experience. Paul had the same experience. In the spirit, am I? So, mm. was either implied in the writings or expressed in the writing. In this case, Habakkuk will express his visitation. So, he was thinking about the things, you know, so, and then he saw the vision. What have you? God come from Tamar. Mountain prime, that's high mountain. It doesn't come with, you know, with shaking, with lightning, sound, wonder, right? So he was caught in a different realm, where the realm where Moses was able to talk with God in the middle of thunder, lightnings. Make a sense to you? You know, all these lights see the thunder lightning ever over the top of the mountain. But Moses there was pretty quiet, peaceful, and I come in with God. Take you to that? Or wrong, you silent one. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm. This way is amazing eh, because it's talking about the fire as well. Go ahead. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Isn't that amazing? So that's his presence. Mm. The amazing God is considering fire. You can look at this as well. So, I mean, if you don't say, enter into his body, you literally see all these things. You know, everything melt before him, you know? I mean, his, his own eyes come with a fire, you know? So, his mouth come with fire, you know? He reads I've had a full of energy and lighting, you know? So, it's crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. Think about it, so, go ahead. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. There was a hiding of his power, as my translation. Hmm. His power hiding from there. So what kind of power? <coughs> this is a demonous power, whatever power you can think about. It's all consuming power, right? So yeah, hmm. don't 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 need to worry about it, you can move on now, so move on with your reading, so yeah. Alright, you're in the same place as me. Mm -hmm. The one of them 
is in the 49th Psalm and reads thus, He will deliver my soul from the power of the grave, for he will take me. Our version conceals the allusion by its unfortunate and non-literal rendering, receive. The same word is employed there as here. Can we fail to see the reference? The psalmist expects his soul to be delivered from the power of the grave because God takes it. And again, in the great 73rd Psalm, which marks perhaps the high water mark of pre-Christian anticipations of a future state, mm. we read, Thou wilt guide me by thy counsel, and afterwards take me, again the same word, yes. to glory. That's basically the taking the glory of the child, you know, so. Mm. It's crazy, huh? Yeah. Amen. Well, we will stop there. We don't need to finish all those expositions. Verses like sermon, you know, get the key points, be fine, so. Sure. Sorry, not to be disrespectful. I tried to, to use this yeah. as material for fellowship, for discussion. Make it sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the next thing. You can get stop with that. So.